Worship God. We sing to his praise from Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And we shall sing from the beginning of the psalm. This is a psalm of David. David speaks of his Lord. He was the head of the, the nation, uh, but he is speaking of um, his Lord, and the Lord did say unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes a stool, for on thy feet me stand. Uh, the Lord challenged the Jews with his verse. They were refusing to acknowledge um, who he was as the Messiah, because as a Messiah, he is the one who is now at the Lord's right hand. So we'll sing verses 1 to 5 of Psalm 110. We stand to please God and remain standing for prayer.
Let us pray. O Lord our God, we come to thee through the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank thee for him, because without his work in giving his life a ransom for many and in continually making intercession for the transgressors, we would have no hope of approaching thee. But we can come with confidence because we come through Christ. We seek the help of thy Spirit that we might know his enabling and that therefore our fellowship might be with thee, the Father, through the Son and by the Spirit, that we might be conscious that we worship one triune God who is ever blessed. We come, Lord, to praise thee and we thank thee that thou art the one who makes people willing in the day of thy power to come to thee. We confess that without that, we would never come to thee. Our natural tendency is to ignore our sin, to avoid our sin, to explain it away, to try and make up for our own sin ourselves. But Lord, we thank thee that thou art the one who reveals that to us and who has provided a way of salvation and who reveals this also to sinners that they might embrace Christ freely offered in the gospel. We pray that Christ would go forth in his gospel chariot this evening, that he would cause many to bow the knee before him and willingly embrace him as a saviour and that there would be a day of his power uh, in, a heart, in, in many places, and the hearts of many would be turned unto him. O Lord our God, we acknowledge thee as the ever-blessed one, and we pray that we would ever seek thy glory. And so in our worship, give us an eye to thy glory. Keep us from that man-centered worship, which is... Uh, uh, offensive to thee, help us to recognize that thou, the Holy One, art to be the center of all our worship and that all that we do is to be focused upon thyself. And we pray that thou wouldst be not only here amongst us, for thou hast promised to be in the gatherings of thy people, but that thou wouldst be in every place where thy people gather. Fulfill thy promise, keep thine own appointment. And grant, Lord, that we would meet with thee and know the sweetness of fellowship with thee and that uh, we would be able to see at the end of our time it was good for us to be here. Our Lord and God, bless those unable to gather with us. Thou knowest their circumstances and their needs. We thank thee that we can commit each one to thee. Lord, bless them and do them good. May those who are struggling with ill health uh, know thy healing hand upon them. May those who are away be given a time of rest and refreshment. May those who may be struggling uh, spiritually uh, be spoken to by thee and receive a blessing from thyself. Lord, that thou wouldst bless each one according to their need. Remember us here and speak to us from thy word as we read it together. May the Spirit himself take of the truth and apply it to our hearts, we pray. Hear us and do us good and cleanse our sin for Jesus' sake. Amen. We shall uh, read the word of God as we find it in the prophecies of Zechariah. The prophecies of Zechariah and chapter 6. Zechariah, the second last book of the Old Testament. Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi in the last few books of the Old Testament. Zechariah and chapter 6. And we read from the beginning of the chapter. And I turned, and lifted up mine eyes, and looked. And behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, 
and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses. In the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go, that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he unto me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of uh, them of the captivity, even of Heldai, of Tobijah, and of Ediah, uh, Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of uh, uh, Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedech, the high priest. And speak thou unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crowns shall be to Helem and, and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Hen, the son of Je Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen, and may God bless to us that reading of his own holy word. We continue to praise God from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and reading there at verse 15. Psalm 22 at verse 15. This is a, a messianic psalm of the sufferings of Christ, also the glory which followed his sufferings. Verse 15, he complains as one on the cross. My strength is like a potsherd dried. My tongue it cleaveth fast unto my jaws. And to the dust of death thou brought me hast. For dogs have compassed me about. The wicked that did, me, that did meet in their assembly me enclosed. They pierced my hands and feet. A prophecy of the sufferings of Christ. We'll sing verses 15 to 22 to God's praise. My strength is like Oh, uh -huh. 
God's Word in the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and we shall read from the beginning of the chapter, Hebrews 10 at the beginning. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually Meet the, comer, meet the comers that run to perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. But it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Why come? In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore, the, whereof the Holy Ghost also uh, is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to see his flesh, and having a an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And so on. May God bless to us that reading of his own holy word. We again unite in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Our gracious God, we thank thee for the gatherings of thy saints. We pray for grace that we might ever keep our focus upon thee. There are so many distractions in this world. And even uh, when we handle the things of God, we can still uh, become distracted from the main focus of things and how we have need of thy help to keep our eyes upon the Lord Jesus, the one who is to be found through all the scriptures. May his name be magnified this evening as we worship thee. Grant, Lord, that we would see Jesus high and lifted up as a priest upon the throne and that we would be drawn to worship and adore him. O oh Lord, do thou purge us of our sin, cleanse us in the blood of Christ, and grant us thy blessing that we might know that uh, indeed we can draw near through Jesus Christ our Lord and do so with confidence. We thank thee that in the midst of a world where there are so many tensions and where there are troubles continually, that it is not in the hands of men or the hands of the evil one, but that Christ reigns and rules over all. We thank thee that he must reign till all his enemies are put under his feet. We thank thee for this, the Lord's day, which reminds us of his great triumph over sin in the grave and how it gives us that hope and expectation that one day he will be seen to have the victory. What a glorious day when Christ shall return, when the dead in Christ shall rise, when they shall be transformed and meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Grant us grace to press on, to be diligent in our calling, to run the race set before us looking unto Jesus, and to be faithful unto thee in this wicked world. We confess that we live amidst a crooked and perverse people. O oh Lord, how sinful and wicked our generation is. We confess that often we are not as we should be, that there is nothing in and of ourselves which can even commend ourselves to thee but we plead the blood of sprinkling, even the Christ and his finished work. May his name be magnified worldwide. Bless the gospel to the ends of the earth then. Remember those missionaries connected with us in France and in Spain and Sri Lanka. Remember especially I servant in Sri Lanka where there is so much disruption and unrest at this time. Protect him and the congregations there. And grant, Lord, that they would yet be used for the furtherance of the gospel. May they bear a good confession before those around them and be used of thee to gather souls into the kingdom. We pray that thy kingdom would come throughout the world. Bless the gospel amongst Jew and Gentile. Hasten that day when the Jews will acknowledge that Jesus is the very Christ. Lord, do thou bless those who work amongst them, teaching them the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, witnessing to them, and distributing thy word. 
Lord, that thou wouldst bless thy truth to the ends of the year. Remember us here, bless our witness here, to our, in our homes, in our families, and in our workplaces, Lord, that we, thou wouldst give openings and enable us to speak a word in season. Bless our witness as a congregation in this town and in this community. And grant, O Lord, that there might yet be a transforming work of grace done. O, oh, that there might be a turning unto thee. Come and work, Lord. We pray that thou wouldst remove from the pulpits of our land those who preach falsehood and error, and that thou wouldst raise up those who would be faithful preachers of the grace of God and the gospel. So, Lord, hear us, we pray. Bless us and do us good. Remember all in need, comfort those who mourn, strengthen those who are weary, be with those who are tried and troubled, help those who may be knowing the attacks of the evil one, discouraging them or distressing them or seeking to turn them away from thee. Grand Lord, that thou wouldst bless and keep them. Hear us, Lord, we pray and do us good. And bless thy word to us as we meditated upon it together. O oh Lord, hear our prayers and forgive our sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. We continue in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, we'll sing verses 22. So the 23 to 28. 23 to 28. Praise ye the Lord, who do him fear, and glorify all ye the seed of Jacob, fear him, all that Israel's children be. But he despised not nor abhorred the afflicted's misery, nor from him hid his face, but heard when he to him did cry. What an encouragement to us to praise God and to continue to trust in God, thinking of how he did not abandon Christ, but that he exalted Christ and raised him from the grave on the third day. He did hear him, although it didn't seem that way when Christ was on the cross. We sing verses 23 to 28 to God's praise. Oh. 
me please to the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, and as the Lord would enable us, we might consider together the passage we read in chapter 10, and especially verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 10 and verses 12 and 13. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. In this um, letter, we find the writer constantly contrasting Christ with other uh, people. He contrasts him uh, with the angels, with Moses, and especially with the Old Testament priesthood. And the message, of course, is Christ is better because he is the one who actually saves and here in this part of the epistle, as he is just repeating the same truths in a sense from different angles, uh, he turns round, as it were, to those Jewish believers and says to them, look where Christ is. Where is Jesus today? He is seated at the right hand of God. And that immediately tells us he is better than the Old Testament priests. Why well, go back and have a priest that you can sp speak to and meet with on earth and go through his rituals when you've got one who is at the right hand of God, seated there. Let's notice the message that there is in these words as we meet the seated Saviour, the seated Saviour. And we'll notice there are three reasons or, uh, why he is seated, or there are three lessons to be drawn out from this fact. This man, after he hath offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 
The first is this. He is seated as he is resting. He is seated, seated as he is resting. Think of the work of the Old Testament priests. There they were daily at the altar, ministering daily, offering the whole variety of sacrifices that were appointed to be offered. And we know that uh, there's a reference to the um, sprinkling of blood and um, it may be that uh, the writer is thinking especially of uh, the Day of Atonement when the uh, high priest went into the most holy place on that one day a year there to sprinkle blood at the mercy seat which covered the Ark of the Covenant. Once a year he does this. Or it may be that he is thinking of the sin offering. The blood of the sin offering was taken and it was sprinkled upon the veil of the temple that divided the holy place from the most holy place. Um, it was, in a sense, as far as the priests could go as they offered sacrifice. And as they indicated uh, by the sprinkling of blood that a death had taken place. So there is the Old Testament priest. He's constantly offering and then he is constantly presenting the offerings before God. He is pleading them and saying through the sprinkling of the blood an offering has taken place, a death has occurred, and here is the result of it, and may blessings come because of it. And yet the writer tells us that the same sacrifices were repeated day in, day out, year after year, and at the end of the day, they didn't really deal with sin. Verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, it is only, a, it is only foreshadowing the reality of things which were to come can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. They wouldn't have stopped, he's saying, if they actually worked. But they didn't work. They couldn't make people perfect. There was a problem. They never actually brought peace with God. They could preach about the way of peace with God and point to some other way of providing peace with God. And they did that as they pointed to Christ. But in and of themselves, the blood of a bull or of a goat or a sheep did nothing to actually deal with the problem of a guilty, guilty conscience. And also it couldn't make the person offering perfect. It couldn't deal with the reality of their sinful lives. It couldn't cleanse them. It couldn't make them holy. They came and they offered. And they went away still sinners. Guilty before God. And indeed liable to sin more and more. Unless they were embracing the reality of Christ's death which was to come. So there's the high priest and the other priest. Well, the high priest, he always seems to be working. He's always either by himself or through his representatives, the other priests, offering for sin. There is no rest for his labours. Day by day, morning and evening, continually there is work to be done. He is standing, ministering, at the altar. And we can see that he stands. But it's even when he is going into the holy place. And especially going into the most holy place. He is not one who lingers there. Especially on the day of atonement. The high priest must have been fearful that something would have gone wrong. 
that as he went in with the blood and sprinkled it, that all would go well, that he might be able to come out again, that all would be safe. And the godly, amongst them as well as the high priest, would have been fearful in case things somehow went wrong. Indeed, the priest just going into the holy place to sprinkle the blood on the veil would have been somewhat anxious, but especially the high priest. He would never feel at home there. He's allowed in once. There's a cloud of incense that is filling the place. And he knows he's about solemn business. He is dealing with the most holy God. What relief there must have been both for him and the people when they heard the high priest coming out and when they saw him once again, the ritual has been done. All has gone well. You know, we've been on various occasions where we've just been relieved. All went well. Nothing disturbed it. Might be a wedding. Might be a communion service. It could be some other thing. But you know that sense of relief. And especially if you've been involved, there can be a sense of relief. There was no mishap. No one tripped. Nothing went wrong. Well, that was the same for the priests and especially the high priests on the Day of Atonement. There's no rest. But look at Christ. We read, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What a difference there is. Where is he? He's in a more holy place than the temple, the holy place, or even the holy of holies. He has entered into heaven itself. He is in the very presence of the Father. And he is there seated. There's no fears. He is one who is now seated and resting in that place. Here he is, the one who has a unique sacrifice. Notice that. Having offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Or oh, it's no beast he's offered. He has offered himself. Because we read, I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. And he has gone to the cross. And there he has offered himself as that once-for-all sacrifice to deal with sin. Here is this unique person, our God-man redeemer. Truly God, truly man, two natures, and one person forever. <coughs> and as that sinless Son of God, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, he has been able to offer himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. Friends, was this not the purpose of his coming? There's a quotation from Psalm 40. Um, and um, how he speaks of how um, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sin. Wherefore, say, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. The Lord had fitted him and prepared him with a body that he might, in our nature, suffer and die, be obedient unto death. He comes to do thy will. And he comes to give his life on the cross. And he goes there to the cross. And there suffers all the agony of the cross. The physical agony, but especially that spiritual agony of being made a curse. Of receiving all that 
sin deserves because he's the Lamb of God who is bearing away, who is carrying, who is responsible for the sins of the world, that is, the sins of all his people. And he is there delivering us from the curse of the law by being made a curse. A unique sacrifice. That's what Christ is offering. But you'll notice it's also an acceptable sacrifice. The Father's pleased with it. You know, through his life, he could say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But we can actually say that on a cross, that's, that's the same thought. Now, it's not uttered. Christ cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he is literally abandoned. That is, in his human nature, he has no, given no sense of the Father's love or care or support or upholding because he is under the judicial wrath of God because of sin. But yet, at the very same time, therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life for the sheep. If, the, if Christ pre pleased the Father always, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, can we not say that at the climax of his work, he was never so lovable to the Father as there at the climax of that obedience, he gives his life a ransom for many. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, but the Lord takes pleasure in him as the bearer of the sins of his people. And the fact that he is now alive, he is, where is he? He's not in the grave. He's at the right hand of God. He has been exalted. He has been raised from the dead and he has been uh, lifted up high. There is proof that he has dealt with sin, that the curse of God has been exalted, that he's paid the price He's done the time. And as a prisoner gets released once he's exhausted the sentence and done the time, so Christ is released. And what's the message? He can deal with sin. He's dealt with sin. And for all who trust in him, their sins are forgiven. Here's this acceptable sacrifice. You'll notice... It was an unrepeatable sacrifice. It was one sacrifice for sin, forever. No one else could offer that sacrifice but him. You could give our bodies to be burnt. Well, we would deserve God's wrath and condemnation for doing that. We deserve God's wrath and condemnation for our sin because our very offerings to God are tainted by sin. But here's the one who is acceptable. And you'll notice it's an effective sacrifice. It's of lasting value. It deals with sin. He says in verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all here is this message. For by one offering, verse 14, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Here is the one whose death has secured the perfection or the justification of his people. He's dealt with sin, he's removed sin. Removed our guilt. And also, through his death, secured our holiness, our sanctification. So he has done this. That's the one sacrifice he's offered, and it's effective. So, his work as an offering priest is over. There was a time 
when he was working. But he is no longer working as an priest who offers a sacrifice. He's resting. He's seated. The sufferings are a thing of the past. The sacrifice has been offered. Yes, he still intercedes, pleading the cause of his people. But we might say his being seated, his very presence in heaven is an act of intercession. You know, we're not to think that he's on his knees groveling. Or oh, remember my people, I died for them. Bless them, forgive them. There's a dignity to his intercession. His very presence is a reminder there to the Father of that one sacrifice, accomplished, finished. He is a solid basis for that pleading. And his very presence in itself is a plea. And he always shall be heard. So, he's seated because he is resting. And that's telling us he is worthy of our confidence. Now, how does this speak to us today? Well, when you're convicted of your sin, where shall you find relief? It might be the sinner who is seeking relief because they're feeling their sin. We're looking at something of that this morning. Or it might be a believer who, well, time and time again, they stumble into sin. They're aware of their own inconsistency. Where will you get relief? Look to Christ. See your great high priest. Where is he? He is seated at the right hand of God. See him as the one who has offered that one sacrifice for sin forever. And as you look to him and rely upon his work by faith, faith relying on that work, saying, I want no other way of approaching to God but through that one sacrifice. As you see him seated, is saying, he's finished the work. The sacrifice is acceptable. And what does that mean? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not condemned. So if you are united to him by faith, God looks upon you as he looks on him. And how does he look on him? With satisfaction, with pleasure, with delight. And therefore he looks up on you, dear believer, with satisfaction and pleasure and delight as one who has kept the law of God perfectly. Of course you haven't, but that righteousness of Christ is yours. And remember, yes, you fall into sin. But what did John say in 1 John 2? Little children, these things are right unto you that you sin not. Don't be sinning. It's inconsistent for a Christian to sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sin. We've got an advocate, we've got one who intercedes, one who's seated at the right hand of God, one who is pleading the cause of his people. Remember that. And rest your hopes on the death and on the intercession of Christ. You've got an advocate who's never lost a case at law and never will. Because all who make use of him and rely on his work are accepted because he has been accepted because his sacrifice is acceptable. When you're going through difficulties and you're troubled and you feel your need of God's help, 
Remember where Christ is. You have a high priest who is a man who sits on the right hand of God. He's one who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Sinless, but experienced temptations. In other words, he's sympathetic. He understands the various situations we end up in. And when you're thinking, well, no one understands me and how I need God's help, does he understand? Well, remember, Christ who pleads your cause. God's right hand understands. He can say, I've been there. I've done that. I've gone through that. I know what it's like. Because apart from sin, he was tempted in all points as we are. Essentially, it was just the same. Though his life in some ways was very different, yet we remember that the experience of God's people, by and large, is the same. Outward circumstances vary, but the core things really are just the same. Perhaps another application would be this. Is it not sad to think of the folly of Romanism, which turned the Lord's Supper, into a literal sacrifice, the sacrifice of the Mass, believing that uh, you had the literal body and blood of Christ on an altar and actually being sacrificed again. It's a perpetual sacrifice. And yet the cross is the only sacrifice for sin. And therefore it's blasphemous to think of the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice. As if it does anything to deal with sin. The Lord's Supper represents and symbolizes the death of Christ. In the same way that the bread and the wine symbolize the body and blood of Christ. And common sense tells you that's all they are and that's what they remain. And indeed scripture uh, speaks of them as merely bread and wine. They don't change into anything. But by faith, they become the symbols of his death. It's sad to think of many people who are tied to ritual in a church rather than the reality of the death of Christ Friends, we should be grateful for the work of Reformation, which restored Christ and the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the truth to the centre of the uh, church life again. He's seated because he's resting. We must move on. Notice, secondly, he is seated as he is rewarded. Note the place where he is seated. That tells us much. We read that he has sat down on the right hand of God. The right hand of God. What is it to sit down on the right hand of God but to be in a place of power and honour and authority? So here is the highest honour in the universe to be seated at the right hand of God. There's nothing greater than this. It's a place of monarchy. It's a place of rule, of dominion, of authority. Indeed, don't we read in Philippians 2, having spoken of the sufferings of Christ, Paul goes on and says in verse 9, Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus Every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he himself could say, all power and authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Here he is, 
rewarded. Because he humbled himself, he is rewarded, and he is the one who is over all things. Now, insofar as he is divine, he is God, he is worthy of all honour, and always was. But you'll notice this isn't said as he is God, but as he is the Christ, the God-man, the servant. And it says the Christ, he is worthy of this reward. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and honour and glory and dominion. Friends, isn't it amazing that there's a human nature on the throne of the universe, as Rabbi Duncan said, the dust of the earth and the throne of heaven. Because that human nature is of Christ is there. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. What's happened? That one who was born of Mary is highly exalted. There he was exposed. How weak he appeared. Think of him, an infant having to be held and carried and fed, having to learn, a little child growing up. Then you think of him especially exposed to, uh, with uh, the, the lack of power he seems to have as he lives his life. You see him in his weakness, poverty. You see him mocked. But especially you see that disgrace when he is hanged on the cross. They spit on him, they revile him. They put him to death. What shame. And it gives way to glory. For three days he was in the grave. His body did not decay. But on the third day he rises. And then the resurrection, you see the beginning of that reward. And then he's ascended. And now you see him. Where is he? Sit thou at my right hand. That's what he's told. He has given us place of honour and glory. The Father is fulfilling that which was promised to him. Go and die. And I will raise you again. I will glorify you. Father, glorify thou me with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Now he is declared and seen to be the Son of God with power. Friends, let us be thankful that Christ is exalted. Doesn't it give you joy to think of him rewarded? He, as the God-man, our Redeemer, deserves this reward to be exalted and glorified as the Saviour. And as you rejoice in the thought of him being rewarded, that should encourage you. Because you, in your own way, go through difficulties and troubles and may be tempted to ask the question, is it worth it being a believer? Well, persevere. Because we're told that believers are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Christ, with him there was the sufferings and glory that was to follow. And the same is for you. There is an eternal reward. There is glory to come. You shall share in that glory of Christ. Remember, he is rewarded. And after your pilgrimage in this world, you will be rewarded as well. You know, some people think, I'm getting a bit weary. And I'm always serving, I'm always serving, I'm always giving. Don't know if others are, but I am. Banish such thoughts. You're accountable to your master as others are. And if others are being less than they should be, well, 
They'll have to give an account for that. But remember, there's a glory to come, an eternal reward. Secured to you by Jesus Christ. He is seated because he is rewarded. He's resting and he's rewarded. But then notice thirdly, he is seated as he is reigning. As he is reigning. Christ here is described for us as one who is on the throne. You notice it is. He sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And here he is. And you find fulfilled what we have read of in Zechariah 6.13. The priest upon the throne. In Israel, priest and prophet were separate. They come together in Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king of his people. And the one who is priest is the one who has been exalted high above the heavens, given a name which is above every name, a name at which every knee shall bow, exalted above all principalities and powers and authorities, made head over all things for the sake of his church. Ephesians 1.20 all things are put under him. He's rewarded by being seated and declared to be king of kings. He's seated because he's reigning. He's seated because here he is in control of the universe like a king on a throne. And nothing in the universe is out with his control. And he is reigning over all things for the good of his church, for the good of his people, and for the advancement of his kingdom. And you'll notice he's reigning patiently. That's something we're not good at, is it? Being patient. Especially in spiritual things. I wish the Lord would work. We long to see him working. Um, Vindicating his name, building up his church. We're concerned for others. But notice the patience of Christ. We read, from henceforth, from now, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. He knows that his enemies are going to be made his footstool. The picture, of course, is using that um, imagery of... Uh, Times when um, kings would sit on their throne, they would have a footstool, and perhaps their enemies would be made, they would be put under the feet of the king. You think of someone standing over their enemies, their foot on top of them. Well, here is Christ, his enemies being made his footstool. He's waiting until then. Now, it might not appear that way, It doesn't appear as if his enemies are going to be made his footstool. The devil is raging. Unbelief is raging. Malice against God's people in the world. Persecution in these days. There's persecution in our day. There's the death of God's people. There are so many enemies against the rule of Christ and his people. But you know, Christ is working. Slowly overcoming his enemies. Defeating them by destroying them or overcoming them and drawing them to himself. And he is here awaiting that day when they will be fully overcome. And when those who remain implacable opponents of Christ will be seen to be foolish. They're made his footstool. He's standing as it were with his foot on top of them, as a victor. And he's seen to be the victor. And you know, there's going to be a glorious day when every enemy will be subdued under Christ, 
All opposition will be put down. The last enemy, death itself, shall be swallowed up in victory. And the world and Satan will be judged. And all who are opposed to him will be condemned and cast into that bottomless pit and into the lake of fire. And he's going to make that new heavens and new earth. And there's no enemies there. There's only those who are holy. It's a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And you and I get impatient, but Christ is not impatient. He's aware that the Father will be faithful to his promise and that he will be seen to be the victor and he'll give him it in due time. He knows that by his death he has secured victory over his enemies. He's already overcome Satan and he's going to condemn him. He's removed the sting out of death for all who trust in Christ. You know, Satan's malice forwards the work of the kingdom. Do you see that in Acts chapter 8? The death of Stephen, persecution comes. What's the result? The church is scattered. Seems a disaster. The gospel goes into Samaria. Things develop elsewhere. The gospel spreads. The malice of Satan ultimately is ultimately cannot stop God's plan and purpose to save sinners and to advance his kingdom. And it actually becomes part of what God uses for the advancement of his purpose. God's plan and purpose was that Christ would die on the cross. Satan there, no doubt thinking, well, we've got him at last. Isn't that wonderful? The end of Christ. And there on the cross, Christ overcomes the evil one. As you and I see mad things happening in this world, persecution of people, wars happening, remember, there is the malice of Satan which is wrong and the wickedness of evil men which is wrong which, and which for, for which they're accountable to God and they'll be judged. But although these things at times might seem to hinder the church, nothing can. God's plan and purpose will be fulfilled. Death itself is but the servant of God to bring his people home to glory. His kingdom advances. Sinners are being saved by his death. He is working. His people are being brought home to glory. And the kingdom is advancing until that day when he completely overcomes his enemies. Don't lose sight of the fact that Christ reigns, dear believer. Remember these things. Be encouraged by these things. Be patient and yet be looking for the victory. Because he shall overthrow his enemies, build his kingdom, vanquish Satan, sin and death. Remember, he is seated because he is reigning. How important then to be found bowing the knee before King Jesus, receiving him as saviour and bowing before him as Lord. If you will not bow before him as Lord, one day you will be made his footstool. But for those who embrace him as saviour and as Lord, they're going to reign with him forever. Make sure you're found with Christ forever for a fearful thing to be made as footstool. Let us praise God then that he is seated 
and let us rejoice that he saves and he reigns tonight. Let us pray. Lord, bless thy truth to us. We give thee thanks for Jesus Christ, our glorious Saviour, the one in whom there is a full and a free salvation. Bless thy truth. And may we be encouraged to think of him as seated at thy right hand. Bless the truth to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We conclude in Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and at verse 32. Psalm 68 and at verse 32. All ye kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to this King, for he is Lord that ruleth all. Unto him praises sing. From verse 32 to the end, to God's praise. Oh, 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 of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.
Amen.